Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons that's prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled, God's Mission, My Mission. And this is lesson number 11 in that series for December 16 of 2023, entitled, Mission to the Unreached, Part Two. Last week, we talked about Part One, how to reach out to the unreached, and now we're gonna see if we can get some more information about how to try to reach out to people who really know nothing about our religion or even about Christianity. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Father, we have come now to do our very best to try to understand better some ways in which we might be able to reach out to those around us. We have this idea that the gospel needs to go to the whole world before you can come again. And so we have a task before us, help us to find ways to reach out and do that task is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. How can we minister to the unreached in the cities? Particularly, we're talking about cities now. Our Bible study guide gives us some ideas, Jim. From the beginning, a loving God sought his children, his lost children in Genesis 6, excuse me, three. Genesis 3, Nine. Nine. And to our, and to this day, this same loving God is still seeking to reach the lost, Revelation 14, 6 to 12, including the lost in the cities. In 2018, the United Nations published its latest findings, which say that 55% of the planet's population live in urban areas. And this will grow, if time should last, to 68% by 2050. We have no choice we have no choice. We must witness to those in the cities from the Bible study guide. If we're going to reach the world, where is the world living now? Cities. In the cities. Well, Genesis 3, 9 seems like a gentle effort to contact Adam and Eve. Where are you? You know, that story. That, that seems nice and very appropriate. Revelation 14, 6 through 12 sounds more like a terrible warning than a loving appeal. Is it possible that God has given us this warning because he realizes that the end is upon us? I mean, what would you do? An example that's been told to me is if you were near, you were up on a high mountain and you saw your child wandering over close to the precipice, yeah. would you say, oh, honey, please come back? <laughs> or would, you, or would you, <laughs> you use a little more direct language? So how many Seventh-day Adventists do you think are actively trying to witness the people in urban areas? In this lesson, we will notice that Jesus made several efforts to reach groups of people, even individuals that were not Jewish. One of his most remarkable missions was the time he traveled with his disciples outside of Galilee all the way up to the area of Tyre and Sidon. Do you think the disciples were comfortable traveling in that area? Mm -hmm. So let's think about that for a minute. I'm not, I don't have time to review the entire chronology of the life of Jesus, but in the last year of Christ's life, here on ministry here on this earth, the first six months spent almost entirely outside of Judean or Galilean territory. He was primarily focusing on teaching his disciples, getting them ready for what was coming. And then the very last six months, he, he was directing everybody's attention to Jerusalem and what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. And you can go on, you know, we can go more detail about that all. But so during this six months we're talking about, Jesus is almost exclusively outside of Jewish territory, outside of Galilean territory with his disciples. Later, many of the disciples, including Paul and his associates particularly, made a major effort to reach out to people living in cities, even in the capital of the empire, Rome. Do we have any evidence that either Jesus or any of his disciples ever traveled to the cities of Tyre or Sidon during his ministry? What do you, what, from what you remember? It's been implied that, that he went there, but as you point out, it's... The Bible says that they went to the region or territory of Tyre and Sidon. Well, look at those verses. Jim? Matthew 12, 21. Oh, 15. 15. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, my, my, what an excuse. 
Jesus left this place and went to the territory near the cities of Tyre and Sidon, American Bible Society, Good News Translation. Went off to the territory near the cities of Tyre and Sidon. So we don't have evidence there that he actually went to the cities. So what kind of people lived in these cities and in the surrounding territory? Had the Hebrew people had any previous experience with them? Carrie? Uh, I'm usually starting with Judges 3, 1 through 6. So then the Lord left some nations in the land to test the Israelites who had not been through the wars in Canaan. He did this only in order to teach each generation of Israelites about, yeah, that's Israelites, about war, especially those who had never been in battle before. Those left in the land were the five Philistine cities, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, and the Hivites who lived in the Lebanon, Lebanon mountains, from Mount Baal, Hermon, as far as Hamath Pass. They were to be a test for Israel to find out whether or not the Israelites would be, obey the commands that the Lord had given their ancestors through Moses. And so the people of Israel settled down amongst the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. They intermarried with them and worshipped their gods. And that's okay. in his Bible. Now let's think about this. God went through that incredible process to get the Israelites out of Egypt, take them up to Palestine. What were they supposed to do? They were supposed to allow God to, to get rid of the people there. Okay, or out. chase them out or whatever. The original thing says chase them out. And they were, pla they were planted in Palestine for what reason? Crossroads of the world. It was the crossroads of the world. Of the world in those days. So they were supposed to be evangelizing anyone they came in contact with, right? Yeah. And what did they do? They joined they them. They became them. Syncretized them with them. Yeah. <laughs> Squandered it. So they intermarried with them and worshipped their gods. That is exactly what would have happened to the Israelites in Egypt if God had not prevented them from living among the Egyptians. When the Israelites moved to Egypt, Pharaoh gave them a separate area in which to live. That allowed them to grow into a nation. And there's a whole story about that. Look at Patriarchs and Prophets 130 and 131 and 1 Kings 5 and 1 Kings 11. In Joshua's day, the children of Israel were supposed to end I'm sorry, enter the land of Palestine and either chase out all the Canaanites and their associated peoples or to destroy them if necessary. Even in the days of David and Solomon, they had a fairly close working relationship with the peoples in those areas. So close that Solomon married young women from those areas. And the results were? Disastrous. Disastrous. But Jesus recognized that people in those cities and throughout the cities and the rest of the Mediterranean world would need the message of the gospel. Now, what do you do if the wrong, the evangelization is going in the wrong direction? Jesus made intentional efforts to face the biases and bigotry of his disciples and challenged them to reach out to such peoples. What challenges face us as we seek to reach uh, out to urbanites in our day? To live in many cities today is a challenge because of the high cost of living, racism, bigotry, nationalism, and constraints on religious freedom and expression in many areas. This is true especially in the 1040 window. Nevertheless, God's, what is the 1040 window again? 10 degrees north and 40 degrees south of the equator, yeah. around the world, okay? Everything close to the tropics plus. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, God's end time people are given the specific challenge to go to the cities and spread the gospel. So are we ready to go? So what can we do if we personally can't go to those areas? At least we can pray for those who do live in the area cities and those with min who minister to the urban population. Gordon, I think the next one's yours. Matthew 9, 35 to 38. Jesus went around visiting all the towns and villages, 
He taught in the synagogues, preached the good news about the kingdom, and healed people with every kind of disease and sickness. As he saw the crowds, his heart was filled with pity for them because they were worried and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So he said to his disciples, the harvest is large, but there are few workers to gather it in. Pray to the owner of the harvest that he will send out workers to gather in this harvest. From the Good News Bible. So how did Jesus mean for that request to be fulfilled? Who is the owner of the harvest? He is. The Father. So, what, what is God supposed to do? Inspire us to go. Okay, well, there's a good start. The city which Jesus dwelt with the most during his ministry, had dealt with, I'm sorry, not dwelt with, but the city which Jesus dealt with the most during his ministry was the city of Jerusalem. And how did he feel about his efforts trying to reach the people of Jerusalem, in Jerusalem? Uh, Luke 19, 41. He came closer to the city, and when he saw it, he wept over it. Wow. Try to imagine what you would do if you were seriously ill, disabled, or needing medical attention in Jesus' day. The word got around very quickly that Jesus was performing miracles of healing. Matthew 4, 23 to 25 is one of those places. Jesus went all over Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news about the kingdom, and healing people who had all kinds of disease and sickness. The news about him spread through the whole country of Syria, that's a long ways away, up north, so that people brought to him all those who were sick, suffering from all kinds of diseases and disorders, people with demons and epileptics and paralytics, and Jesus healed them all. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Ten Towns, that's on the other side of the Jordan from Jerusalem, Judea, and the land on the other side of the Jordan, which, which is the Ten Towns. But that's not all. There were more. Jim, Mark 3. Mark 3, verses 7 and 8. Jesus and his disciples went away to Lake Galilee, and a large crowd followed them, followed him. They had come from Galilee, they had come from Galilee, from Judea, from Jerusalem, from the territory of Edomia, Where's Edomia? From the territory of Edomia. Oh, that's east, isn't it? Well, it's way down south and yeah. a little bit east. Yeah, it's where, where uh, Petra is. Petra is, yeah. Down southern, this southern part of the, east of the of, country of, of uh, um, Jordan now. East of the Dead Sea there. Mm -hmm. uh, from the territory on the east side of the Jordan and from the region around the city of Tyre and Sidon. All these people came to Jesus because they had heard of the things he was doing. From the Good News Bible. Okay, how many? Some of those people had traveled more than 200 miles to come and see Jesus. That's a long ways. Okay, Ellen White comments. Carrie, after the encounter with the Pharisees, Jesus withdrew from Capernaum uh, and crossing Galilee, repaired to the hill country on the borders of Phoenicia. Looking westward, he could see spread out upon the plain below the ancient cities of Tyre and Sidon with their heathen temples, their magnificent palaces and marts of trade, and the harbors filled with shipping. As from Ellen White, Desire of Ages 391. Okay, here's your trivia question. See how much you, who's the famous evangelist who came from Sidon? Jezebel. Jezebel. Yes. She came over to Israel and said, we're going to convert all these Israelites to worship, be worshipers of Baal and Ashtoreth. She was pretty successful. Mm. Terribly successful. Maybe even more successful than Jonah. Yeah. Many people who live in urban settings are driven by the desire for money, fame, property, etc. How can we convince them that there is something beyond all of that which is worth much more? Should we be praying for the Holy Spirit to create a hunger for something better? Is that, is that appropriate to say, okay, Holy Spirit, I don't know how to reach these people. I'll go with what I know. Can you convince them that they need something better than what they've got? Show me what to do better. Yeah. yeah. 
It is interesting to compare the words from Matthew in these settings when Jesus reached out to non-Jewish peoples with the words from Mark. The Gospel of Matthew seems to be written more specifically for a Jewish audience. Notice, think about that. While Mark was written primarily for a Gentile audience. Notice the difference between the two. Actually, gospel, uh, Mark's Gospel was whose Gospel? Peter. Peter. Mark was the one who wrote it down, but it was Peter's Gospel. And Peter, finally, after a lot of sort of, I don't know what you call it, coaxing from Paul and others, did quite a bit of work among the Gentiles. So he would now take more, whereas Matthew didn't go. He, Matthew pretty much stayed and worked among the Jews. So notice the difference between what, Ma how, what Matthew says about this lady and what uh, Mark says about her. Um. Matthew chapter 15, verses 22 to 28. A Canaanite woman who lived in that region came to him. Okay, so there's our first clue. A Canaanite woman who lived in that region, okay? Son of David, she cried out, have mercy on me, sir. My daughter has a demon and is in a terrible condition. But Jesus did not say a word to her. His disciples came to him and begged him, send her away. She is following us and making all this noise. Then Jesus replied, I have been sent only to the lost sheep of the people of Israel. At this, the woman came and fell at his feet. Help me, sir, she said. Jesus answered, it isn't right to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. That's true, sir, she answered, but even the dogs eat the leftovers that fall from their master's table. So Jesus answered her, you are a woman of great faith. What you want will be done for you. And at that very moment, her daughter was healed from the Good News Bible. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself how this woman came to know about Jesus? Mm -hmm. And this was another remote healing, wasn't it? Yeah. So healing at a distance. Yes. So the Canaanites were despised by the Jews. They, the Jews were supposed to have driven, driven them out or destroyed them, you know, a thousand years earlier, even more than a thousand years earlier. The Jews would not have had anything to do with that woman. Okay, now Mark, speaking for Peter, says what? Verse 24, chapter 7. Then Jesus left and went away to the territory near the city of Tyre. He went into a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, but he could not stay hidden. A woman whose daughter had an evil spirit, so he didn't say a Canaanite woman. No. He didn't say Canaan, a territory near Tyre woman whose daughter had an evil spirit in her heard about Jesus and came to him at once and fell at his feet. The woman was a Gentile born in the region of Phoenicia in Syria. She Look at that. What's the identify, identification of this woman? Gentile. She's a Gentile. Not a Canaanite, a Gentile. She's born in Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus answered, let us first feed the children. It isn't right to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Sir, she answered, even the dogs under the table eat the children's leftovers. So Jesus said to her, because of that answer, go back home where you will find that the demon has gone out of your daughter. She went home and found her child laying on the bed. The demon had indeed gone out of her. Good news Bible. Wow. Notice that Mark called her a woman, a Gentile, born in Phoenicia. The Gentiles were, would recognize her as being one of them. Matthew, by contrast, called her a Canaanite. To his Jewish audience, she would be despised. And notice these interesting words. Mark 4, 24. 7. 7, 24, sorry. Then Jesus left and went away to the territory near the city of Tyre. He went into a house and did not want anyone to know he was there but he could not stay hidden. Good news Bible. Was Jesus trying to hide? <laughs> Why was he in that house? Was this a time for him to focus on his education of the disciples and he was trying to get some private time? You've suggested that was the purpose. What do you think the disciples thought of Jesus reaching out to the Canaanite woman? The Canaanites were the people that the Israelites were supposed to have driven out of Palestine or even destroyed completely when they came from Egypt. They followed the customs that were practiced in Sodom and Gomorrah. See Genesis 18. 
So what can we learn from Jesus' approach to this woman? Ellen White says, Christ did not immediately reply to the woman's request. He received this representative of a despised race as the Jews would have done. And this he designed that his disciples should be impressed with the cold and heartless manner in which the Jews would treat such a case, as evinced by his reception of the woman and the compassionate manner in which he would have, have them deal with such dis distress as manifested by his subsequent granting of her petition, Desire of Ages 400, paragraph two. We should do, not do you think the disciples learned something by Jesus treating the woman as they would have treated her? Well, I hope it, they it made an impression years what, later when they wrote it down. But yeah, well, Jesus time. is trying to say, I'm sure he, he pointed out in one way or another the contrast between this and this. He must have pointed it out. What I know about Jesus, he would have to. Yeah, why did both Mark and Matthew write it down decades later. Yeah. They thought it was important. Yeah. We should not need to be told that God loves everyone. That should be clear even from John 3, 16. Then notice also 1 John 2, 2, Jim. And Christ himself is the means by which our sins are forgiven, and not our sins only, but also the sins of everyone. It's not a matter of, it's, that's a bad translation. It's not forgiven. The word is a femi, which means get, get over, it to become healed from sin. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness, everybody's forgiven. If you forgive a, a debt, people say, oh, well, the number came up, but it'll happen again. People don't learn anything when you forgive that way. Carrie, would you do the Bible study guide there for us? Yes. In the unreached neighborhood of the cities, there are many who long for hope. During Christ's time, what prevented God's people from bringing hope of the Messiah to such foreign cities as Tyre and Sidon? Nationalism, pride, and prejudice blinded God's people to the opportunities to see those nearest to them who longed for the hope foretold by the prophecies of the first advent. Today in the cities, there are many population groups with whom Jesus Christ wants his people to share the, quote, blessed hope, unquote, of the second advent, Titus 2.13. And just as Jesus didn't care what their nationality or race was, neither should we. Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. That's pretty blunt, isn't it? Yes, it is. Titus 2.13, what does it say? As we wait for the blessed day we hope for, when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will appear. Yeah. What other stories give us some clear indication about how we should uh, relate to the people who are not from our, from our comfort circles? Look at the interaction between the Holy Spirit and Peter back in Acts 10. Acts, Pardon? Acts 10, starting with verse 9 and then jumping some. The next day, as they were on their way and coming near Joppa, Peter went up on the roof of, his, of the house about noon in order to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. While the food was being prepared, he had a vision. He saw heaven opened and something coming down that looked like a large sheet being lowered by its four corners to the earth. In it were all kinds of animals, reptiles, and wild birds. A voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Certainly not, Lord. I have never eaten anything ritually unclean or defiled. The voice spoke to him again. Do not consider anything unclean that God has declared clean. This happened three times, and then the thing was taken back to heaven. And some people I've talked to say that it's talking about the meat. Yes. But it wasn't. Verse 28, he said to them, you yourselves know very well that a Jew is not allowed by his religion to visit or associate with Gentiles, but God has shown me that I must not consider any person richly unclean or defiled. So how did he show him? By the vision that was mm -hmm. just mentioned. Yep. Peter began to speak. I now realize that it is true that God treats everyone on the same basis. 
Those who worship him and do what is right are acceptable to him, no matter what race they belong to. Good News Bible. Okay. God was using a vision to directly confront Peter with his religious pride and bigotry, bigotry against Gentile, the Gentiles. What lessons do you think God intended for us to learn from the story of the woman from the region of Tyre and Sidon and also from Peter's vision and interaction with Cornelius? Do we have any bigotry? Well, not us, surely not. Nationalism or even spiritual pride to overcome? A number of years after Peter had his experience with Cornelius, another experience took place that gives us a little hint about the challenges of dealing with prejudices which we have had since we were children. This story also involves Peter, same Peter. Okay. It's from Galatians 2, verses 11 to 13. But when Peter came to Antioch, I, Paul, ex uh, opposed him in public because he was clearly wrong. Before some men who had been sent by James arrived there, Peter had been eating with the Gentile brothers and sisters. But after these men arrived, he drew back and would not eat with the Gentiles because he was afraid that those who were in favor were in favor of circumcising, of in circumcising. What, 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 were the, what, what did the Judaizers say? If you want to be a Christian, you must, you must be a Jew first. Which okay. means you have to be circumcised. Yes. The other Jewish brothers and sisters also started acting like cowards along with Peter and even Barnabas was swept away by their cowardly action. Wow. Do you think Peter learned something from that interaction with Paul? Well, I think it's interesting for us to look at, I mean, how far down the road was this in Peter's ministry? And he still makes mistakes. Yeah. Still? So we might make a mistake or two. Us? Even you? Even me. Do you think, Peter, uh, well, Jesus left some very challenging words about the people who live in our day. Luke 18, 8, I tell you, he will judge in their favor and do it quickly. But will the Son of Man find faith on earth when he comes? Will the Son of Man find faith on earth when he comes? Mm -hmm. Good News Bible. It is very interesting to notice what Jesus said or indicated about various non-Jewish individuals. Look at some of them. Matthew 8, Jim. I have never found anyone in Israel with faith like, faith like this. And who is he talking message. about? The Roman, the Roman official. official. Roman official, okay. And Mark 2, 5, when Jesus was dealing with the men who had brought that paralyzed man to Peter's house and let him down through the roof, how much faith they had. Matthew okay. 20, verses uh, 29 to 34. Jesus responded to the blind beggar outside of the city of Jericho. We do not know whether the blind beggar described in Mark 10, 46 to 52 was, were Jews or not. In any case, Jesus responded to their call. Compare Matthew 20, verses 29 to 34 and Luke 18, Luke 18 uh, verses 35 to to 43. Notice in Luke 18, 43, Jesus said to them, then see, your faith has made you well. The Bible study guide, this list includes people with faith that have shown even dark, in dark cities. In Capernaum, Jesus highlights several people with faith. In Matthew 10, excuse me, Matthew 8, verses 10 and 13, we see a converted pagan centurion with great faith. We meet four faith-filled friends who ripped up the roof to bring their paralyzed friend to Jesus in Matthew 29, Matthew 9, verse 2, and Mark 2, 5. In Mark 10, we meet the former blind man, Bartimaeus, whose faith shines bright in Jericho. Wow. In the same time, we would expect that among God's people, there would be great faith. Yet, even in Jesus' hometown of Nazareth, little faith, or even outright unbelief, was the limiting factor to Jesus' ministry. And his disciples, several times, Jesus said in Israel, O ye thou 
of little faith. Hmm. Wow. Jesus explains, O faithless and perverse generation. So why do you think it was that almost every reference to people among the Jews, it was you, little, you with little faith, and when he reached out to people who are not Jews, I've never found such great faith. Why, why do you suppose that is? By the amount of information they had available, they didn't. <laughs> the Jews thought they had all the information. Yeah. I am sure that the devil was doing everything he possibly could to make things backwards. Sure. You know, the people who weren't supposed to have faith had faith, and the people who were supposed to have faith didn't have faith. Of course, the devil didn't try to make the people who were non-Jews have faith. He just was very successful as having the Jews not have faith. <laughs> okay. It's interesting to see how Jesus commended the faith of foreigners and decried the lack of faith of the Jewish people themselves. Do we have any way of knowing where real faith might be found? Can we tell it by looking at the people who walk down the streets in big cities? Okay. Jennifer, is that Carrie or Jennifer? Which one is? I think it's me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, BSG, challenge. Open your heart in prayer for a greater portion of faith with which to share your love for those near and far. Challenge up. How did you come to know Jesus and the precious three angels' messages? List three spiritual blessings that you have experienced from Jesus in your personal life. It's okay. Right. Go ahead from our Bible study guide for Thursday. Yeah. Okay, what would be the purpose of talking about three spiritual blessings? Don't everybody talk at once. Thinking about it. So, what was the question again? Well, what were the three spiritual blessings. I mean, basically, what's what, what's what's happening here? If you talk about what Jesus has done for you, it, 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 people remember stories like that. Yeah, yeah. And you know, there's some amazing stories. That um, I mean, not everybody has amazing stories, but if you start looking around for the stories of what. People have had remarkable stories. I mean, yeah. people raised from the dead and all kinds of stuff, even in our day. Well, Ellen White said, Jennifer? Among those whom the Jews styled heathen were men who had a better understanding of the scripture prophecies concerning the Messiah than had the teachers in Israel. There were some who hoped for his coming as a deliverer from sin. Philosophers endeavored to study into the mystery of the Hebrew economy, but the bigotry of the Jews hindered the spread of the light. From Ellen G. White, The Desire of Ages. And another place from Ellen White, the Lord Jesus, the mighty Savior, has died for these souls. He can arouse them from their indifference. He can awaken their sympathies. He can soften their hearts. He can reveal to their souls the beauty and power of the truth. The master worker is God and not finite man. <clears throat> and yet he calls upon men to be the agents through whom he can depart, impart light to those in darkness. God has jewels in all the churches and it is not for us to make sweeping denunciation of the professed religious world, but in humility and love present, it, present to all the, the truth present to Present, presents Present to all, to all the truth as it is in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Let man see piety and devotion. Let them behold Christ-likeness of character and they will be drawn to the truth. They are to lift up Jesus, the world's redeemer. They are to hold forth the word of life. Ellen White from Review and Herald, 1893. Okay. The Bible study guide says, what are some of the immediate needs in the areas where you live that could give you and your church an opportunity to reach out to these souls who don't know the truths that we do? And look at Ellen White's words from the Adventist Review. Regarding those of other faiths, God has some tools in all the churches and it is not for us to make sweeping denunciation of the professed religious word. 
world. And you, some of you are familiar with the quotation. She says specifically, we're not to deride Catholics. In other words, how can we show people the error of their ways while at the same time not denigrating the people personally? That's what Paul was trying to demonstrate, right? When the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith in the earth? From the New King James Version. What does Jesus mean by this rhetorical question? What is the difference between faith and belief? You've probably heard stories about that. Uh, we know that the word for faith and belief in the original Greek is just the same, exactly the same word. Why might people who have correct belief be found void of faith when Christ returns? From our Bible study guide for Friday. Okay, Jim? From the Bible study guide, although the gospel according to Matthew was written specifically for a Jewish audience, the presence of Gentiles near Jesus is a recurring theme in this narrative, sometimes in contrast to the devotion of Israelites. For example, while the Magi, the Persian astrologers, come a long way to honor Israel's true king, the chief priests and scribes, that is Herod's wise men, make no effort to do so. A Roman centurion's faith is praised by Jesus as greater than that of the Israelites, Matthew 10, excuse me, Matthew 8, verse 10. The Gentile execution squad is the first to confess Jesus' divine sonship after his crucifixion, Matthew 27, 54. In this distinctive way, Matthew highlights three things. God's redemptive plan has always included all the nations of the earth. Number two, the Gentiles are not insensitive to the work of, of the Holy Spirit. And that number three, laying aside ethnic, cultural, and religious prejudice to love and serve others, as Christ did, is a prerequisite of effective cross-cultural ministry. Thus, apart from being a call to global mission, Matthew's gospel also is a message of ethnic reconciliation in Christ. The other, Go ahead. Okay. The other gospel writers also highlight notable interactions of Jesus with Gentiles. He extended his outreach to the Gentile region of the Gadarenes, Mark 5, 1. He healed a Roman centurion's servant, Roman centurion's servant, Luke 7, 1 to 10. And he ministered to a Samaritan city, John 4. Jesus' interaction with foreigners revealed that the kingdom of God is for all nations, Jews and Gentiles alike. Jesus demonstrated in practical ways that God has always been concerned with extending his love and forgiveness to all nations. Okay, now is, I'm gonna... Isn't that what Revelation 14 is? is come out of Babylon? Mm -hmm. Come out of the confusion? It's for all nations. All, yeah. it, uh, it, and, and, and think about that, I mean, if we believe that uh, the gospel has to go to the whole world, Matthew 24, 14, before Jesus can come again, do we have any responsibility for the 1040 window? Yes. Do we have any responsibility for the cities is the whole topic of this lesson. Yes, Just specifically those cities. What are we doing about cities in India or China that 10 billion people? 10 million, I'm sorry, 10 million, 20 million, 30 million. Mexico City, I think now is 30 million. Wow. What are we doing? Radio. Getting further and further behind. Yeah. Well, it seems so. So that's why we have now the internet, radio, TV, artificial intelligence? I don't know. Yeah. From Genesis 12, 1 to 3, we can see clearly that it was God's plan for the descendants of Abraham to spread their teachings about God throughout the entire world. And how well did Abraham do it evangelizing? Very well. Very well. Hundreds of people were part of his larger family. They were to, a they were to be a blessing to others and others were to bless them. This plan was formulated before this earth was created. Consider just a few of the foreigners who interacted with the Israelites earlier in the Old Testament. 
Rahab, who was she? Rahab was the one that let them down over the wall. Canaanite, her word. She was a Canaanite prostitute. Yeah. Ruth. And Rahab became a ancestor of David yeah. and Jesus. Right. Jesus, yes, yes. And what about Ruth? Moabite, wasn't she? Descendant of one of Lot's daughters. Uriah the Hittite. Where did he come from? Non-Jew. Definitely a non-Jew. The Queen of Sheba. What about Job and Melchizedek? Okay. I think Jennifer, that's yours, is it? From Ellen G. White. Outside of the Jewish nation, there were men who foretold the appearance of a divine instructor. These men were seeking for truth, and to them, the spirit of inspiration was imparted. One after another, like stars in the darkened heavens, such teachers had arisen. Their words of prophecy was kindled hope in the hearts of thousands of the Gentile world from the desire of ages. Wow. And Gordon, next one. Those whom, uh, whom Christ commends in the judgment may have known little of theology, but they have cherished his principles. Through the influence of the divine spirit, they have been a blessing to those about them. Even among the heathen are those who have cherished the spirit of kindness. Before the words of life had fallen upon their ears, they have befriended the missionaries, even ministering to them at the peril of their own lives. Among the heathen are those who worship God ignorantly. And among the Christians are those who worship the devil yeah. knowingly and mm -hmm. ignorantly. That's not in Ellen White. Those to whom the light is never brought by human instrumentality, yet they will not perish. Though ignorant of the written law of God, they have heard his voice speaking to them in nature and have done the things that the law required. Their works are evidence that the Holy Spirit has touched their hearts and they are recognized as the children of God. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, 638. And Myra? From Ellen G. White, divine love has been stirred to its unfathomable depths for the sake of men and angels marvel to behold in the recipients of such great love, a mere surface gratitude. Angels marvel at man's shallow appreciation of the love of God. That's very true. Wow. Angels stand indignant at the neglect shown of the souls of men. Would we know, know how God regards it? How Christ regards it. How Christ regards it. How would a father and a mother feel? Did they know that their child, lost in the cold and, and the snow, had been passed by and left to perish by those who might have saved it? Would they be not terribly grieved, wildly indignant? Would they not denounce those murderers with wrath hot as their tears, intense as their, lo intense as their love? The sufferings of every man are the sufferings of God's child. And those who reach out no helping hand to their perishing fellow brings provoke, beings provoke his righteous anger. This is the wrath of the Lamb. Wow. There's a definition for you. Yeah. To those who claim fellowship with Christ, yet have been indifferent to the needs of their fellow man, we will declare in He that, will declare. He will declare in that great judgment day, I know you, not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of in, iniquity. Luke 13, 27. And quote in Desire of Ages. Yeah, that's from Desire of Ages. 825. I put in those last two or three paragraphs from Ellen White because I think they illustrate something that we, we really, really, really need to think about. Talks about among the heathen. And what did the heathen do in these paragraphs? They worshiped God ignorantly. They worshiped God ignorantly. And what else do they do? 
They were open-minded and the kind. And they were kind to missionaries. Yeah. And that's, that parallel would be Romans 2, 14 and 15. When mm -hmm. those who do not have the law show that the law is written on their heart. They yeah. so on and so forth. And how did they get there? Not for, from a book or not from a preacher. It's that they responded to spirit of truth. So the, that's a question. But I mean, in, 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 of all the stories you know about heathen, you usually think of them as being loving and kind and gentle? Not exactly. In New no, Guinea. Yeah, there are examples. In New Guinea during World War II, they helped tremendously all of our troops. And there were some people in that area that were really, really, you might say, base, rock bottom. Mm -hmm. And they, they. Cannibals. Yes. And uh, they had their weird house where they would put heads from. They arrowed people, but when it came down, they used to bring wounded soldiers down from up the Kokoda Trail, and they would take other supplies back up. And these people had no education and all that stuff. And mm -hmm. that, I mean, I heard that. I knew some of the missionaries that dealt with some of those people. Yep. Yeah, they're very, very, I mean, Cannibalism was very common in some parts of New Guinea. Oh, yes. And yes. what happens when your soldiers move in there? Well, you, some of you have heard of the, the book written by an anthropologist called The Long Pig? Yes, yes, The Long Pig. That's exactly right. Talking about cannibals. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember ever reading what I just read from Ellen White. Does that really? I, I know I have, but the story about... Uh, you know, the, the child being left out in the yes, snow. Yes, the cold and the snow being passed by could have been saved. It's just like the good, the good Samaritan. Well, it is. The, the, the priest that walked by another priest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who was a at least an, at least yeah. another Levite. Two yeah. priests walked by. <laughs> well, it seems clear that Melchizedek was regarded by Abraham as a faithful follower of God. And where did? Where did he get that information? Where, where did he live? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Salem. He was the, the king of Jerusalem. When someone blesses another person, it is assumed that the one who is blessing is regarded as being favorable over the one he or she blesses. I mean, isn't that generally considered to be the case? Thus, Abraham regarded Melchizedek as his superior. Is that possible? Abraham was the father of the faithful, right? So how did Melchizedek end up being his superior? Well, Abraham must have had something to do with it, as for maybe education or something, so, or, or dealing with other people and other nations, who knows? Yeah. So where was Abraham living in those days? Not far from Jerusalem. Okay, and he had to move constantly. He had, I mean, he had 318 soldiers protecting his flocks and his herds. How many, how many flocks and herds do you have to, if you require 318 soldiers just to protect them? So what happens? You got to move all over the place, here and there, up and down. I'm sure, I mean, I have to assume that, that, you know, Melchizedek became his friend somehow or other. Yeah. And what was the circumstance under which Melchizedek blessed Abraham? So after Abraham came back from defeating those who had tried to destroy, well, had destroyed Sodom, where, where Lot had, was. Mm -hmm. At least they, conquered the they city conquered and the cities and stole stuff. took them off and yeah. captive and looted the place. And Abraham caught up with them and brought them back. Yeah. And on the way back, he was blessed by Melchizedek, who probably went out with people from Jerusalem and brought them food and water to drink or probably orange, I mean, grape juice to drink and so forth like that. So anyway. When someone, uh, uh, yeah. So what should we conclude from this lesson? 
it is important to note that God's unrelenting missionary outreach to, God, to note God's unrelenting missionary outreach to his creatures in various ways does not make believers' involvement in the mission irrelevant. I mean, I've asked this question before for you to think about. I mean, why doesn't God send angels to do the evangelizing? You know, they could move in the 1040 window without any problem. Why does he expect us to do it? Why does he want us to do it? <laughs> Something we can learn. Something we, huh? Maybe. We need the experience. We need the experience. But those people need it now. Yeah. We aren't there now. Yeah. So why aren't we there now? Send the angels now. We'll go later. <laughs> okay. We we'll go later. Oh, boy. Okay. Um, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And just to review that, because we haven't looked at that today. Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all people everywhere. Does that include the 1040 window? And make them my disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you till the end, basically it says. Okay, and notice something else very interesting. 1 Peter 2.9 but you are the chosen race. And who's Peter writing to? Well, I'm asking kinds of all. It's the Jews, isn't he? Peter, no, no. Peter is writing to the Christians in Western Turkey. Oh, okay. Okay? Yeah. So, and we should extend that. that That's all Muslim territory now, isn't it? Uh, mostly. You remember my story about the, the guy who was <laughs> giving us a tour of that part? A university educated guy who was obviously had some leanings toward Christianity. And I asked him one time after we'd been traveling together quite a bit, I said, well, um, how many people in Turkey are Muslim? Oh, I said, there's a simple answer to that. When you're born, your birth certificate is there and they stamp Muslim. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, that's the way it works, right? Okay, well, look at this. But you are the chosen race, the king's priest, the holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his own marvelous light. Do those words sound familiar to you? From some other place in the Bible? Those are exactly the words that... God spoke through Exodus. Moses to the children of Israel in Exodus 19. Yep. Just before the... The kingdom of priests. Yes. And are we being a kingdom of priests? Well, how are we doing in making disciples of, uh, for Christ? Is, is, our, is our fundamental reason for existence, both as a church and as individual believers, according to the Bible? Yeah. Is it a privilege for us to be co-laborers with God and what he would and what he could accomplish perfectly well without our participation. I mean, couldn't God just take care of all these problems? He doesn't really need us. So why does he ask us? We have a lot to learn. Yes. Also knowing that God is ahead of us, preparing the ground for the sowing of the gospel seed is another incentive to accept the privilege he graciously extends to us to be a part of his team. Shouldn't we be, I mean, I don't know. Does it sound like a good idea to have God as your partner? Sounds like a pretty good idea to me. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus stated specifically in John 10, 16. Let's look at that really quickly. There are other sheep which belong to me that are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them too. They will listen to my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Okay. He had other sheep outside of the Jewish community. As we have noted, Jesus frequently reached favorably, uh, reacted favorably with non-Jewish peoples. So, how does that, how does that Im impact us? In a previous lesson, we talked about refugees, immigrants. Should we be, as Christians, reaching out to refugees and immigrants? Seems like an obvious place to, lead, to, to reach out to, right? After Jesus was gone, 
the disciples had a conference in which they seriously considered the issue of reaching out to Gentiles and making them Christians. The results are recorded in Acts 15. And we have a couple minutes left. Uh, you remember, let me just read the conclusion to that story. Really quickly, I'll make it a little bit larger so we can see it. After meeting together with the brethren back in Jerusalem, Paul and Barnabas and, and Silas came back and they concluded uh, here, the Holy Spirit and we have agreed not to put any other burden on you besides these necessary rules. Eat no food that has been offered to idols, eat no blood, eat no animal that has been strangled, and keep yourselves from sexual immorality. You will do well if you take care not to do these things with our best, best wishes. Okay, so the first general conference meets, and this is, this, these are their instructions. What is going on here? rules on how to get along with other people that um, in the church so that you're, the Jews weren't repulsed by the, uh, by the non-Jews. What did these requirements have to do with the gospel? Even in the disciples' day, there was so much prejudice against Gentiles that these requirements were necessary and those instructions important to allow former Jewish believers to associate with newly baptized Gentile believers. Do we have any problems with prejudice like that in our day? It's a wonder they had any Gentile believers. Yeah. But some of the Jews were, were converting Gentiles to Jewish beliefs. We read about that, we talked about that. So what happened to the Christians? Well, in Exodus 19, 6, God called upon the children of Israel to be as priests. We read about that, the parallel passage in, in um, 1 Peter 2, 9. He has given that same challenge to us. And there it is again, but you are the chosen race, the king's priests, the holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God, who called you out of darkness into his own marvelous light. Are we primarily, do we think of our, our lives primarily as evangelists? convinced of his apostleship to the Gentiles, there's the verses, and boosted by the proceedings of the Roman Jerusalem Council, Paul did all these things that we're asked to do. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to study these things and to accept these challenges. We knew, we're not doing very well, perhaps, but we see the challenges. We, we believe that we need to accept them we need to reach out to people who are not familiar with Judeo-Christian thinking and find ways to touch their hearts, to convince them to, to love you. You are there ahead of us. The Holy Spirit is there ahead of us. We know that you can do the touching and the healing, but help us to do the part that we should do is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.